Hello, folks. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dan Cullum, and it's my pleasure to be with you today for this Amos virtual event. We're here on behalf of Snowasis Medical to talk about BioExclude or the Amnion Corion product and its applications in minimally invasive surgery. Snowasis was established in Denver in 2007, and the first uh, BioExclude product was uh, delivered in 2010 and I was privileged to be among those that started using it early on. It has good re uh, research background and the folks at Snowasis are great to work with. I choose to use a BioExclude for this reason. It carries multiple accelerated healing agents with growth factors and anti-inflammatory properties. The material is antibacterial and immune privileged. And so it acts as both a barrier, but more importantly, a carrier of those products um, in one off-the-shelf uh, bio-exclude product. The amnionic uh, and chorion tissues are derived from a placenta, and we've known for many years some of the benefits of this uh, placental tissues with multiple different collagens, laminin, fibronectins, and proteoglycans. More importantly for what we're concerned with are the uh, wound healing cytokines and the anti-inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, which really can help with tissue regeneration. And there's an extensive number of them, as we can see. Uh, when we look at the uh, lion's share of the, of the uh, growth factors, the beneficial ones are predominantly in the chorion layer. Uh, the amnion layer does have some, and uh, for example, EGF has a Dominance of more um, in amnion, but for the most part, the chorion is the beneficial tissue. Uh, BioExclude is classified as an HCTP product or a human cell tissue and cellular tissue based product, and it's regulated by the FDA under Section 361 uh, as a minimally manipulated homologous tissue. Donors are pre screened, and after via elective cesarean section, the tissues are. Um, quarantine process screened and uh, following the uh, strict regulations of the AATB or the American Association of Tissue Banks. So this is how BioExclude is uh, derived. Um, when we look at the processing of the tissue, it's a patented purion process and we are then relaminating the amnion and chorion layers back together to get the maximum amount of growth factors. A non-purion processed amnion membrane has a very limited amount of growth factors compared to even a purion processed amnion. This processing uh, removes the spongy and epithelial layers. And so these are taken out and then the exposed basement membrane laminins uh, help hasten cellular migration over top of the wound and the amnion chorion layers are laminated together. With these growth factors, they are then distributed um, uh, throughout the wound, uh, initially by uh, release into the immediate wound area, and then subsequently over four days, we see diffusion of the uh, growth factors as we can uh, extract from normal saline. And additionally, uh, the collagenase that's released into the wound naturally uh, releases the remaining amount of growth factors over time. The signal agent that comes from the uh, wound and the dehacum in the area it then goes to the marrow and sends out stem cells rec rec recruiting and homing factors and these stem cells are then um, brought to the area uh, and uh, enhance wound healing significantly. We know from uh, this um, poster presented at AAP that the um, amnion chorion tissue is antibacterial and kills uh, multiple bugs that are present in the oral cavity and potential uh, harmful to wound healing. We can see for a direct visualization, just simply placing the uh, amnion chorion tissue in an agar plate that we get a zone of inhibition around this gram-negative facultative anaerobe uh, AA. We look at some of the applications of this. When we look at a Mohs micrographic surgery, this patient's had uh, an area of uh, cancer excised and then bioexclude has been laid into the wound area or it's generic medical as Epifix. And uh, over 10 months, we can see the significant healing in the area with almost no residual scarring, which would uh, not be the norm for any open uh, secondary intention wound healing like this. 
Other medical applications include ophthalmology, uh, chronic wounds, sports medicine, orthopedics, and of course, we're mostly concerned about dental and surgical applications. When this was first released in uh, 2010, it became apparent quite quickly that um, amnion chorion did not follow the traditional rules. Um, it was much thinner, which led to a much better adaptation and ability to uh, trim and manipulate. And we also found that you didn't have to trim it so exact because you could manipulate it and have it conform. And more importantly, um, it will adhere to the surrounding tooth roots or implant or implant healing abutment that we'll show you in some of the clinical cases. And it can be overlapped uh, without any risk of leaking. And it just increases the dosing of the uh, growth factors and beneficial products that are contained in it. When we look at the publications over the last uh, number of years, by 2015, we can see that dental had a significant uh, portion of applications through uh, use of BioX glue. And in the intervening five years, it's uh, continued to grow. So let's look at managing wounds and wound healing and upregulation uh, using uh, BioExclude. We know that when we have an extraction site, we want to have an atraumatic extraction. We want to not damage or break anything. We want to preserve the buccal bone. And if at all possible, we want to maintain the periosteal blood supply without elevating a flap. And use of the specialized surgical instruments is uh, significantly helpful in this regard. With the residual wound, often we're faced with uh, fractured teeth, with failing endodontically treated teeth that can have anaerobic bacteria. We want to be sure that we grossly cleanse and debride the wound site. Um, in some of these wounds that are, are uh, more dirty, if you will, um, I use a betadine soak with 4% uh, povidine iodine, and I put it in a monoject and inject it into the wound for 30 seconds, and then re curette and cleanse the area. Additionally, micro rongeurs are really helpful in some of the smaller access openings for removal of uh, crestal soft tissue or apical uh, granulations. When we look at managing the extraction site, we want to uh, look initially at the first few days here from the initial clot formation and beginning of granulation tissue and angiogenesis to understand that that's what the uh, signal molecules do in enhancing uh, mesenchymal stem cells and with new vascularization that the amnion chorion product stimulates. So in patients that have wound healing issues, that's a significant jump start to healing. The remaining uh, components of healing through connective tissue epithelialization and then bone formation um, are also assisted by the more delayed release. In the tissue regeneration triangle, uh, we know that we have uh, a need for scaffolds to hold and maintain shape for bone healing. We need cells that come in and lay down new bone and clean and repair it. And we also have signal molecules that enhance the mesenchymal stem cell response to the wound, as we showed earlier. So the use of uh, the amnion chorion product um, really significantly upregulates the wound with signal molecules and uh, has a host of those products. It's not a single product like a BMP or PDGF, although those both are helpful and uh, have good data behind them for their applications. When we look at the growth factors that cause angiogenesis, there's a number that are listed here on the left side of the screen as shown by Coop and others. And that helps with the initial recruitment, proliferation, and angiogenesis of that early wound healing. We also can show uh, wound healing in, in, a, in a more general sense. Uh, this study out of uh, Jay Perio in 2010 compared a split mouth study with 15 patients and the uh, uh, amnionic tissues that were utilized showed a significant reduction in pain and inflammation and uh, wound closure. So this is a, a nice way to, to demonstrate the enhancement that it can have just on simple wounds. If we look at this patient, and we'll see this case a little more in depth later, we can see that at immediate implant placement, there is a fairly significant defect in the keratinized tissue on the anterior implant. And we can see by four months that that margin has healed uh, equal to the posterior implant, which had an apical uh, position flap with excess keratinized tissue. If we look at this from the occlusal view, 
we can see that there was no attempt made to close the wound primarily, allowing the amnion chorion to uh, seal to the healing abutment and allow for epithelial migration and regrowth over top of that. Um, and underneath we have the particulate bone graft. So this, this system works very nicely for uh, this size of wound and, and even larger. Here, if we look at another immediate implant application, we're placing it in and around these fixtures uh, for this patient and the terminal molar here, uh, the number 15 site, you can see the healing abutment present. And if we just measure from the healing abutment to the tissue margin, we're at least three millimeters vertically in our defect. The uh, second image from the left shows the uh, particulate graft covered with the amnion chorion. And now we can see by the center image at four months, we've completely regenerated that tissue up to the level of the three millimeter flared healing abutment. On the next image, we can see uh, that same day that three millimeter flared healing abutment was removed and an extra flared five millimeter tall healing abutment was placed. And we can again see the initial responses uh, to that healing abutment, knowing that we have a very good gingival sulcus. The far right image uh, is at uh, final restoration uh, insertion, and we'll show this case later, but you can see the very significant improvement in the buccal tissue dimension in that area of the initial defect. So let's look at initial applications with uh, open socket grafting and uh, bone regeneration. Um, I was privileged to work with Mark Lucas on this uh, report in a compendium showing case series uh, with applications in open socket grafting. This is one of the cases from that study. And here we can see a patient presenting with a significant aesthetic issue with a midline discrepancy. And on the left side, a very significant uh, uh, space uh, compromise compared to the uh, opposite side. And, we looked at her and decided with the restorative doc to um, do this conventionally with fixed prosthetics to have a better camouflage uh, for reconstructing her rather than using implants. Here's her preoperative radiographs uh, showing the uh, right and left uh, sides and the defects. And so our choice was to remove uh, seven and eight and complete uh, grafting with a blend of uh, high temperature xenograft to uh, resist uh, future resorption. Uh, these were grafted and then covered with the amnion chorion, which was uh, tucked in and around each of the extraction sites. And on the right side, we can see these secured with uh, inverse figure eight uh, PTFE sutures. Here's a patient after uh, 10 and 20 days of healing. You can see a very limited immune uh, inflama inflammatory response. And by the 20-day uh, mark, we can see they're completely epithelialized and uh, um, maturing nicely. Here's a patient after uh, initial uh, restoration, and we can see that we're able to, with camouflage and reshaping across the uh, intercanine dimension, come up with a relatively balanced occlusion and aesthetic appearance with the correction of the midline. Radiographically, we can see consolidation of the graft in those areas. And here she is uh, comparing pre and post-op showing uh, a significant improvement in uh, the aesthetics for this patient. Here's an example of a placement of the bioexclude. We have a 12 by 12 uh, piece that was placed, we wet it and then gently pack it in and around the margins, uh, just tucking it in under the uh, epithelium uh, periosteal margin. Now we're suturing the inverse figure eight uh, suture. So first we go through the buccal uh, aspect of the palatal flap and then through the palatal aspect of the buccal flap. And that's tied as a single uh, inverse suture. Posterior, we're doing again, um, buckle through the palatal and palatal through the buccal and doing a posterior figure eight. So we have an anterior inverse suture and posterior figure eight suture. Most molar sites take um, two sutures, occasionally two figure eights. This inverse suturing method uh, lays down the tissue margins nicely and allows for uh, not displacing the graft material. Here's an example with uh, implant placement and uh, crestal uh, contour grafting. 
And so we can see from the um, initial image that we've got relatively good healing at a grafted site, but the buccal bone level is slightly reduced and uh, sloped uh, away on the uh, center uh, image. On the right side, we can see a contour graft that's been placed around the edge of the healing abutment. And now we're taking amnion chorion and modifying it to fit in the interproximal. And here we'll place two pieces around it to cover it or from the mesial interproximal to the distal interproximal. And then we'll apically position the soft tissue to increase the keratinized tissue margin and have near clo primary closure over the site. But you can see there's still voids uh, in the interproximal areas, which is quite typical. And this material does very nicely when it's exposed. Here we can see the patient after restoration showing the good contour maintenance. And on the right, we can see the radiograph showing good bone levels and the uh, final restoration. Here's an example of a particulate contour graft in the anterior maxilla, and we've mildly shaped the amnion chorion. It's better to slightly oversize it so you can tuck it in and around the margins. We took out a V on the crest to be able to uh, seat it around the implant healing abutment, and that extra component we're placing on the mesial where there was a little bit of a, a Miller 3 defect, and this uh, increases the dose of the products that are uh, in the wound to enhance healing. Uh, here we have the uh, wound closed with uh, 5 glycolon sutures. So let's look at um, immediate implant placement. Um, the second article with uh, Mark Lucas showed a case series with um, immediate implant placements uh, using dynamic navigation and uh, amnion chorion membrane. And uh, Here's an example of this kind of process. Uh, this patient is losing uh, these three teeth and we're placing an implant in the number 11 position as part of a full arch reconstruction. Uh, the residual bone plate is about uh, four millimeters uh, under that uh, labial margin at number 11. Here you can see the drilling and implant placement sequence with the implant placed for uh, eventual screw uh, emergence through the cingulum and there is a moderate to significant uh, buccal defect. And we then uh, will graft that with particulate and then uh, close uh, after replacement of the amnion chorion. And this video will show a similar uh, situation at a single tooth site where we placed uh, a slightly trimmed piece into the buckle, uh, wetted it with uh, sterile water, and then we're tucking it in around the margin. Similarly, if there's a palatal gap, then you take a piece that's shaped appropriately for that, wet it, and then we'll tuck it into position uh, over the graft and uh, about at the periosteal epithelial uh, uh, margin level. Here we're doing the inverse bevel incision or suturing with a five a four o glycolon. We've gone through the palate. Now we're coming out through the buckle uh, with these. Uh, sutures um, on the buccal aspect, we want to come out at about the mid line angle, uh, not right in the papilla so that it is over the greatest area of exposure of the membrane to protect it. Here's this patient after implants uh, are finished in closure and we go through uh, initial healing. And now the patient's uh, at provisional phase. Uh, similar uh, procedure was completed on the uh, contralateral side at number six. But what's important to see is how much bone volume and tissue thickness we have um, using amnion chorion. It really enhances the gingival healing and increases the gingival thickness. Here's a third example of this kind of procedure on another patient with full arch. On the left side, we can see the number six area and on right, number 11. So immediately at surgery, we can see almost the full three millimeters of the healing abutment. Uh, the implant is placed palatally, so there's some gap uh, buccal palatally at the uh, actual extraction site. With this pro protocol, you can see the significant improvement in the soft tissue contour up to the edge of the healing abutment uh, over the initial four months of healing. And the bottom view shows uh, provisionalization as part of the uh, remaining uh, treatment for this patient. But look at the gingival margins of the canines. They're significantly um, lower than they were uh, preoperatively. So let's look at uh, managing immediate molar implants. And so this has been something that's been a part of my practice for uh, 
a good many years and is a major part of what I do every day. Here's an example of a lower first molar tooth number 19 and we can see clinically that there is a mesiobuccal root dehiscence with uh, some recession and radiographically we can see the failing uh, residual root portion. After removal of the teeth and uh, full thickness flap exposure at the uh, distal healed site, uh, implant uh, site development then follows using uh, a normal drilling process. Here we can see the radiograph uh, for site determination intraoperatively. Uh, the implants are placed and we have a moderate buccal gap and a moderate buccal bone defect that you can see on the central um, image. After implant placement, we can see the radiograph on the right showing uh, good clearance to the residual nerve. ISQ testings are completed on both showing uh, good primary stability. The anterior part is then grafted here with a cortical cancellus allograft and now we are going to take and uh, cover that with uh, amnion chorion. So the uh, tissue is in this case covered with uh, 12 by 12 and this is moved in and around and tucked uh, up and onto the healing abutment which it adheres nicely to. And we would typically also place a second piece over the distal implant and then we would uh, reposition the flap. Here posterior, we can see the apical positioning, uh, the thickness and distance of the healing abutment. And anteriorly, we can see the uh, bone gap on the occlusal dimension where we've made no attempt to primary close that. And that exposed amnion chorion is uh, up onto the healing abutment and we're anticipating that with the epithelial migration and wound up regulation that that will completely fill in uh, with keratinized tissue. And uh, we'll look now to see the early healing response. So the sutures have just come out and we can see that it's already slightly improved, but note there's very limited inflammation as we are at this early uh, seven, eight day uh, healing window. As we move through, we can see more normalization of the contour and more filling in of the defects here at another 10 days post-op. And here's the patient at four months showing a very nice conversion of that anterior implant defect into keratinized tissue. And radiographically, we can see this on the right-hand side. So if we just look at it for comparison, the pre-op, immediate post-op, and four-month healing, we can see a very nice regeneration of the soft tissue with this kind of process. And pre- and post-op occlusal. Well, when we're looking at uh, doing minimally invasive surgery, there's a number of components that really enhance what we're doing. And uh, bioexclude is a significant portion of that. Additionally, the newer implant designs and dynamic uh, navigation has proven to me to be a, a critical part of providing minimally invasive care. And I was privileged to be with uh, R.W. Emery and Mike Block and others as part of this initial study with 478 patients and uh, over 700 implants. And we measured all the different categories of positioning in three dimensions. And we found that there was a significant improvement in uh, outcomes, but more importantly, the process to do it is so simple. We just stick a fiducial, do a scan, the staff calibrate, uh, planning takes um, usually less than two minutes, and in 15 to 20 minutes, we can go from seeing the patient to actually doing navigation guided surgery uh, dynamically. The big benefit is, is if we find that there's something in that wound um, that we're not happy with, we can change the plan right in surgery uh, for repositioning, and I find that that's not an uncommon occurrence. So let's look at immediate molar placement using dynamic navigation, but more importantly, the benefits then uh, of this immediate surgery with using a bioexclude for a wound up regulation. Here's a patient that's presenting with a failing um, left sided posterior bridge. And here we're seeing initial planning for implant positioning and placement, uh, requiring a small uh, crestal bump at both sites. And here's the patient after the teeth are removed and uh, we can see the residual bone contours. Using navigation, we then complete uh, removal of uh, 
granulations, placing uh, initial drills to position, and then we're going to use osteotomes to uh, bump up the uh, terminal two sites for a small uh, height gain. With that, the implants are in position, and we can now see the um, ISQ readings confirming our excellent implant stability and uh, initial angles on the far right. We now take here and complete grafting of the uh, facial defects and then covering them with the amnion corian tissue trimmed uh, oversized to fit into those areas. We wet it and then tuck them into position. And then here we've completed closure uh, with chromic. The uh, right side image shows us the defect uh, very nicely uh, showing the uh, palatal positioning. The width of the buccal gap is really important. The wider it is, the better it actually heals and the amnion chorion sealing it allows the tissue uh, for rapid uh, revascularization and epithelialization with keratinized tissue into that area. As a general rule, um, chromic sutures on uh, socket grafting um, are not very desirable because there's too much exposed uh, gluteraldehyde and it's hard on the membrane. Uh, so typically um, I use um, PTFE or the glycolon sutures, but in small wounds, you can usually get away with it like where you're showing here. Here we can see the cross-sectional imaging showing the minor sinus floor uh, changes using the osteotome. And here we can see the patient after a four months healing with uh, excellent tissue response in those areas. Uh, patient went through initial provisionalization process and then here's the final restoration and the tissue contours um, at that time. This turned out to be a very nice reconstruction for this patient and you can see um, idealized uh, hard and soft tissue contours on the uh, lateral image. So just in quick overview, this is a slide we showed earlier. We see a significant improvement in the height of the soft tissue at that area of three millimeters. My experience is that with the amnion chorion product, we see that it regenerates from the amnion chorion occlusally. So it basically acts like a new periosteal or basement membrane layer and the regeneration happens superficial to that. Whereas with most other grafting systems or an open defect, that initial epithelialization layer a granulation tissue turns into the epithelial margin with it healing more apical. So in essence, we're gaining back um, most of the biologic width with using bioexclude. So let's look at another uh, technique that helps us with immediate implants. And so we're going to talk about using immediates with Reamer Burrs for a crestal elevation and then amnion chorion product for around the margins for healing. So here we're using this drill stop. We're using it to get to basically the sinus floor, increasing the, the dimensions up to a 4.1 millimeter diameter with this non-end cutting drill system. The stops give us an extra measure of safety in concert with the dynamic navigation. And uh, we're now at the sinus floor and use it to just get through the floor and then do a bone added technique. And then we place the implant and even with uh, an immediate molar, we're seeing an ISQ reading of 82 with very good primary stability. After packing of the particulate graft around the site, uh, we can see the radiograph on the right hand side showing the implant and sinus elevation. Uh, this patient again had a very significant uh, Miller class three periodontal defect on the molar. So we did um, a partial exposure and a root surface preparation and treating of that area and then grafted on it using the amnion chorion product. And now we're sealing the crestal portion here around the healing abutment with uh, an amnion chorion piece on both the buccal and palatal. And uh, then you can see the inverse sutures uh, closing around the healing abutment. Here the patient is after uh, four months healing and we've got uh, good resolution of the uh, deep pocketing on the mesial of the molar. And you can see radiographically a good bone fill in the areas. And here's a patient one year after restoration. And we can see uh, very nice tissue contours around the immediate molar and that the uh, second uh, molar has had uh, overall good integration and you can see improved grafting density on the distal aspect up to a normal um, contour from the implant to the adjacent uh, second molar surface. 
So this is a, a secondary benefit that we can see significant tissue healing periodontally around adjacent teeth if we apply it also. So let's look at some advanced applications. Um, this is a, a technique for crestal elevation in uh, edentulous areas called contiguous sinus floor elevation, or in this case, more of a crestal window elevating the contiguous portion. Um, we're going to uh, see this patient present and she's got failing uh, distal abutment on a cantilever bridge that's fractured and we can see a buccal fistula on the far left image. We'll note on the radiograph that there is a severe sinus pneumatization and there is a septum in the posterior uh, first molar area. So we've taken our piezo-surgery unit um, and on the center screen you can see the uh, cutting uh, of a window. This is basically four millimeters wide by a centimeter long. This allows us then to approach the membrane uh, without tearing it and then take this bony core uh, and crestally elevate it into the sinus with uh, some minor marginal releasing around the internal periphery with the curette. Uh, using the contiguous elevators, we're able then to mobilize that membrane and then complete a boat added technique and uh, further elevate and add it significantly um, uh, enhancing the elevation. Here we can see the extraction site uh, anteriorly that's been uh, grafted here again with uh, particulate uh, uh, porcine xenograph and then we've uh, grafted the sinus elevation portion and then covered it with uh, the bioexclude and then completed closure primarily over the posterior aspect of the wound anteriorly where the tooth was removed. It's uh, left for secondary intention healing so that we get it filling in with keratinitis tissue and increased volume of uh, KT at that area. Here we can see the patient immediately post-op and the center image shows the radiograph with a greater than one centimeter elevation uh, right up to the posterior septum. And so this was a very nice and minimally invasive way to enhance this site for future implant placement. Here we can see at uh, seven days, the healing around the area. You'll note how limited the inflammation is and the initial fibrin uh, that's covered over the um, secondary intention or the open wound healing at the extraction site anteriorly. Here's a patient after uh, six months of healing and we can see overall good rich contours and bone. But more importantly, on the radiograph, we can see that we maintained a significant crestal elevation in that area. So we go through planning for her, and so we've set her up to be able to have a very uh, simple second stage implant reconstruction in what was a fairly significant defect. The advantage, of course, is, is that there's less pain and swelling because we haven't uh, completed a lateral window approach, and we have a smaller graft volume, so it can heal much quicker um, if we need to get back into the wound uh, to accelerate the uh, implant therapy. What about managing complications with sinuses? Well, we've all had membrane perforations and this product works very nicely. And here's an example of a crestal approach with a defect that was um, uh, encountered after uh, the first day of healing. The patient actually blew out the socket graft and the elevation that was uh, done in this area. So we're here taking a 12 by 12 piece of amnion and we're going to uh, place it into the wound. Uh, we wet it and then the bioexclude is adapted around and over sealing uh, very nicely the um, defect with a patch and it's airtight. Uh, in this case, we elected to place an additional collagen membrane over top of it for uh, further support. And then we completed grafting with a, a xenograft collagen blended plug that we then manipulated uh, into the wound acting like a solid plug, if you will, like for a bathtub and then uh, covered it with a collagen barrier and primary closure. We can see the initial pre-op situation and then on the uh, center and right screen, we can see the secondary uh, repair after uh, fixing of the um, oral antral communication. The sinuses uh, show no uh, significant uh, blood or um, air fluid level and the patient went on to have uh, very good healing. We have an implant placed and here is a one year post-restoration image of uh, this patient um, showing the clinical contours and uh, overall very nice healing and the radiograph on the right side. 
Here's another example of the uh, lateral um, tear in the sinus membrane. And we're going to use the amnion to steal it both uh, intraorally where there was a tear and laterally. So here's the uh, amnion chorion product placed over top and it very nicely seals and adheres to the area. In this case, we elected to cover it with a collagen barrier, but I don't think you'd have to do that with uh, any frequency. Uh, here's the patient uh, sutured with an immediate implant placed uh, within the, uh, the repaired area. And we can see the initial post-op images showing uh, an air fluid level with some blood and clotting in the repaired sinus and the position of the implant uh, with the graft repair. Here's the patient after four months healing. And we can see very nice uh, clinical results and very limited scarring in and around the uh, vestibular area. And here we can see the initial pre-op and the uh, four month healed uh, area on the right hand side showing a complete return of a normal uh, sinus pneumatization with no air fluid level, membrane thickening, and uh, good healing at the implant site. Here's an example of uh, horizontal augmentation using bone cores. This patient had a failed uh, canine eruption therapy and ended up with a pretty significant, almost through and through uh, cortical defect. We elected to treat this with um, a multiple uh, flap approach. The palate was exposed because of the significant defect and a pedicle pellicle flap was elevated as we can see on the right. In the center area, there was root dehiscence on both of the adjacent teeth, and uh, we wanted to augment that as well. And we completed a, a superficial split thickness flap development on the labial to um, increase the uh, amount of volume uh, in the superperiosteal plane for primary closure without advancement. We then harvested bone cores from the right mandible using um, a core trephine system and the screws. Uh, the special uh, Screws are made extra tiny to enable us to place the cores. There was slight mortising uh, of the residual alveolus for stability, and a single screw was placed in each core. Uh, we then overgrafted it with particulate, and on the facial, you can see we've uh, covered it initially with a single layer of uh, bioexclude, and then we'll complete that bioexclude also on the palatal, uh, giving um, initial uh, contour shape and uh, adding all the wound up regulation, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial uh, properties uh, to the site. We then covered it with a collagen membrane and uh, the flap was advanced with the pedicle uh, closed over the main portion. And here we can see the primary closure uh, around this wound and the maintenance of the uh, buccal vestibule without uh, flap advancement. Here we can see the patient after um, a six month healing window. And on the top of the screen uh, across, we can see various cross sections showing the excellent bone contours and the maintenance of bone at the uh, screw level. And we can see clinically that we were able to um, enhance the uh, gingival uh, thickness and quality at both the lateral and premolar sites compared to preoperatively. And we were able to gain some crown um, covering uh, occlusally with uh, wider, more healthy tissue. Here's a patient with this opened after this uh, healing interval. And on the right side, we can see uh, an occlusal view of the implant placed and a periapical of the restored view. Important to see though how nicely the amnion chorion upregulated this healing and the contour we were able to achieve, as well as on the meso of the premolar, see the bone thickness that we have now protecting that site. So that really enhances the long term stability for this patient. Here we're going to show a tunneling application. And here's a patient with uh, bilateral, uh, congenitally missing lateral incisors, and we can see. Uh, the contour changes, a uh, fairly significant undercut on the left side and a quite narrow ridge uh, with moderate undercut on the right. Here we're going to take and use these uh, tunneling instruments uh, through a vertical midline incision and the central screen shows that instrument with the green arrow uh, turned to um, dissect all the way up to and releasing over top of the ridge crest. Uh, we complete the similar dissection uh, bilaterally and then uh, gently and progressively pack bone subperiosteally into the area, shaping it to the desired contour. 
and then at the end we take an amnion chorion uh, piece and we shape it about the size of a wound, grab it horizontally, and then uh, insert it all the way to the end of the wound. At that point, I take my left hand and put my fingers above and below the um, forceps to hold it in position and then remove the forceps with it held uh, nicely across the wound, delivering the growth factors and uh, anti-inflammatory protection to the wound. We then complete uh, midline closure and we can see a very nice improved contour bilaterally with a very minimally invasive approach. Uh, upregulating this with uh, bioexclude, I think significantly enhances healing. Important thing on these lateral views is that we can visualize how much we've widened the bone, not only in the whole the tunneling pocket, but right at the ridge crest and onto the occlusal surface. So this approach uh, really can enhance wounds for us very nicely. Here's a patient after uh, six months of healing. We're opening and placing the implants. On the right-hand side, we're showing uh, the full procedure. And we've then done an additional contour graft with apical positioning of the soft tissue. And we've covered it on the right screen, again, with a, a over-contoured size piece of uh, bioexclude to, again, upregulate both wound healing and enhance the gingival response. Here's a patient immediately post-op. And radiographically, we can see the contours, um, the cross-sectional images, and the occlusal images. And again, regrafting at the uncovering, uh, I think, also helps to enhance and protect the long-term horizontal dimensions. Here we can see the patient with her uh, restoration, showing very nice gingival contours. And she's a very happy gal. So this is an example of using it. Um, the bioexclude to upregulate a tunneling approach. Here we have a patient that's had an amyloblastoma in this area. So she went through a resection and reconstructive surgery and ended up with um, fairly significant scarring and of course a minimal keratinized tissue and a residual basilar bone. Uh, we in this case are doing a vestibuloplasty. So we've done a split thickness dissection and it's, are sewing the residual margin into the apex of the vestibule. Here we're covering it with a very large uh, single piece uh, uh, gingival graft from the palate and then we're covering it with a periodontal dressing for initial protection. If we look at the donor site, this is a pretty significant wound and for most of us we would be really concerned about the post-operative discomfort for the patient. So we would fabricate a stent. In this case, however, we placed bioexclude and the overlaid pieces into the wound and uh, sutured them with uh, uh, inverse securing a 5 glycolon to maintain them in position. And the patient did exceptionally well. Um, she had very little discomfort from this procedure. So uh, this was a significant advance in my care. I will have you look on the center image where we can see there where the stent actually covered the palate, we had a little bit of a superficial necrosis on the palatal margin, where posteriorly where the stent didn't cover, it actually did better. So I, in these kind of cases, I wouldn't even use a stent anymore. I would just go um, straight to the bioexclude. On the right-hand side at three weeks, we can see the very nice healing that this patient experienced with this uh, rather large and uh, owie wound, if you will. Here's the patient after the vestibuloplasty on the lower. The uh, last application we'll talk about is in nerve injury. And here's an example of a patient that we as oral surgeons would see very commonly in our practice where the nerve is transitioning and almost going through the uh, mesial distal roots with a significant risk for injury. Um, in these kind of applications, uh, Dan Hotzkla has a case series and he showed a number of patients that have had uh, significant nerve injury and have done very nicely with repair. And this is one of his cases showing before and after uh, removal of the implants and uh, grafting with the amnion chorion allograft over the nerve and seeing significant improvement. And so his uh, case series showed uh, an average of 6.25 years from the interval from injury to repair. And five patients at 10 sites showed significant improvements of wound sensibility over time, uh, usually within 180 days. So I would re refer you to uh, that for further information. So today we've covered wound uh, healing and upregulation, open socket grafting, GBR, immediate implants, and other advanced applications. 
what is important with this product is some of the questions and what I saw initially was, well, you look in the wound and is the membrane gone? Well, it's a clear translucent membrane. So on the lower left screen, you can see a very typical healer with very typical kind of presentation at four to seven days. In the right, uh, the next image to the right, you can again see a typical healer about 10 days. There's some fibrin, but the epithelial margins are partly contracted and closed. On the right, uh, next right image, the slow healer, we do see some that take a little bit longer to heal, yet they do just fine. And on the far right screen, a smoker at two weeks. So you see a little bit of variability, but we shouldn't be concerned about seeing a small amount of membrane or graft material because it's covered over. And if you do spit out a graft or particle, that's not a concern. It's just a matter of continuing to monitor and watch that patient through healing. Uh, another significant uh, thing is only tap water for 10 days. We don't want to do anything mechanically that's going to disrupt the wound. So we want to make sure the patient does gentle rinsing and doesn't manipulate or play with the area. And we want to avoid chlorhexidine, alcohol, and other surface active agents, especially hydrogen peroxide and even um, alcohol spirits. So I don't let folks drink any hard liquor uh, in this window because any of those uh, things can damage the membrane and reduce the um, bioactivity and delay the accelerated uh, healing of cell migration over the wound. Antibiotics, um, some of the aminoglycosides, uh, there could be remote traces. So someone who's sensitive, we'd want to be careful with any of these antibiotics and it may be a relative contraindication. Uh, it's important that we understand that BioExclude is the only dental product available that has both combined amnion and chorion layers delivering four to five times more growth factors for regeneration than an amnion only product. We did see significant benefits with reduced pain and inflammation as the study from Jay Perio alluded. And in my experience, I've seen really significant advances with wound healing with the gingiva healing from that bioexclude occlusally uh, toward the epithelial margin, increasing the amount of gingival thickness. And here's an example of this patient we showed with the definite improvement in the keratinized tissue and the cellular depth on this patient. So I wanted to thank you for today. Um, I choose bioexclude because it's both a barrier and a carrier and one product. It helps enhance wound healing, has antibacterial and anti-inflammatory properties. So with that, I want to thank you for attending the Snowasis Corporate Forum today, and I look forward now to uh, answering your questions and um, working with you through a successful implementation of this product in your practice. Thank you.